your professor is talking about how people tend to follow their culture. Okay, so what? Think for a moment about your childhood. Did you believe your parents, your teachers, your extended family? What about your family's friends and your social circle? If you were like most children, you accepted the worldview that your parents told you about. You accepted what they told you was true. Why would your mom and your dad lie to you? Why would your grandparents, your aunts and uncles tell you lies? Children are taught in churches and synagogues and temples, and they're taught around the family dinner table. They're taught by their mom and dad when they listen to them, and they pick up clues from those around them. They listen to other children, and those children are generally filtered by their parents. Imagine a child praying to God. Imagine this child is saying, "Dear Jesus, help me have a good night's sleep, Lord Jesus. Protect me from dreams, from bad dreams. Pro protect me, Lord, from bad dreams. The things that children say when they pray, innocent prayers. Bless mommy and daddy. Amen." Is God listening to those prayers? Does it matter? Does it matter if the children's parents have the wrong theology or the wrong God? Does it matter what God the children's parents believe in? If a child's five years old and the parents, let's say the parents are Mormons, does God ignore the child's prayers? What if? She uses the Arabic word for God, Allah. Does God ignore, in the Christian view, all prayers to Allah from children? What if, what if you're a Calvinist and you believe other faiths aren't saved? I assume you must believe that God ignores those prayers because they're not, they're not. Those children aren't part of the elect. Does God listen to a little girl pray if her parents are Presbyterians or Baptists, or does it matter? Does God love her regardless of her parents' position, her parents' theology, what her parents believe? She's only five years old. Does God love her? Imagine, if you will, that you were born in the place of Jeffrey Dahmer. Would you be different, and how so? If you were born as Jeffrey Dahmer, wouldn't you be Jeffrey Dahmer? It might be true that if I was in Saudi Arabia, I'd be a Muslim, but that doesn't necessarily mean Islam's true. What if your soul was placed by God into the zygote that became the fetus, that became the newborn? Named Jeffrey Dahmer. Do you think that there's something innate about your soul that would have made you into something other than a sadistic serial killer? I mean, of course, if you still had the same genetics, the same cells creating the brain that came to be inside the skull of Jeffrey Dahmer, would your experiences not guide you to be Jeffrey Dahmer, or would your soul create a different situation? In what way, as a child, would you have had the mental fortitude to become something other than what Jeffrey Dahmer became? Your psychology will not tell you the truth about whether or not Christianity is true or anything else outside your skull. What will tell you what's true is the evidence. Do you think you were given a soul at the moment of conception that directed the zygote that became you? The moment after the single sperm out of tens of millions fighting to reach the ovum penetrated it successfully. Perhaps you believe your soul pre-existed your conception. Whatever happens to us in the world isn't accidentally, because our souls have entered a series of agreements before coming to the world. Here are five things that your souls agreed to before you were born. No matter, the question remains the same: Is this soul the real you? At this moment, a unique genetic code arises, instantly determining gender, hair color, eye color, 
and hundreds of other characteristics. Certainly you cannot believe that your soul alone determine your height, your body type, your hair color, your eye color, your genetic makeup. Was your gender, your sex, your shyness, your boldness, all the traits that became you, whether you're an introvert or an extrovert. Were those all determined by your soul in the Christian view? Do you account for genetics at all, your upbringing? What about your creativity? What about your optimism, your pessimism, your patience, your compassion, your curiosity, your empathy? Did you possess these as a newborn? At one year old, at five or ten years old, when you were going through puberty? Or did these traits develop over time? Do you acknowledge that they weren't programmed by God into your soul? Certainly you weren't compassionate, empathetic, and resilient as a two-year-old. <laughs> then you're forced to admit you must acquiesce to this. It's a trap, I know. But you cannot escape this trap. You cannot escape the conclusion that this was influenced to a great extent by your genetics and your upbringing. Your genes produced your gender, sex, hair color, your skin color, your eye color, and your parents and your upbringing and your culture. This isn't an argument against free will, although much of the same Socratic questions would apply in that debate. But let's, for the sake of argument, grant some degree of free will, although it doesn't seem to apply to who one's parents are, or what time in history people are born into, or what into what culture. People just seem to show up by means out of their control. So you'd like to think, and I would like to think, that if I was born as Jeffrey Dahmer, or Ted Bundy, or Adolf Lenin, Stalin, or any number of millions of sociopathic monsters in history, that I would be different. That people with ASPD, antisocial personality disorder, people of the lie, that I would be different from them. I would like to think that. The question is, would we? Would we be different people if our souls, if such a thing that Christians propose exist, were placed into different zygotes? I think all would agree that if their soul, if such a thing exists, had been placed into French parents, our Chinese parents, Polish, Russian, our Hawaiian parents, that they'd not be a different ethnicity from their parents. When I was eight years old, and had moved from Hawaii, the place of my birth, to Northern California. A classmate told me that I was lying when I told him I was born in Hawaii. You can't have been born in Hawaii, he said to me, because you're not brown. Hawaiians are dark brown, he said confidently, so I know you're not telling me the truth. I guess it's a fair mistake for a child to make, one that hasn't learned genetics or the birds and the bees. But as adults, we know that genetic material in the sperm and the ovum combine to create a new life. And that zygote has its own unique DNA. It begs the question, doesn't it? Does God place two souls into a zygote that he knows will split into monozygotic twins, identical twins, or does he wait? And thus is one of the twins without a soul until after the split occurs. This might be splitting hairs. But studying how identical twins are both different and similar leads to a lot of interesting conclusions about genetics, upbringing, environment, epigenics, and other things that create personalities and beliefs in people, as well as problems and dysfunction. I did a little digging into some studies using twins as the subject. One of those studies I'll place on the screen. We found that parental antisociality places the child at increased risk for developing a range of externalizing and internalizing disorders. Conclusions. Antisocial parents have children who have increased likelihood 
at developing a broad range of psychiatric disorders. Depressed mothers tended to partner with antisocial fathers. Depression in mothers and antisocial behavior in fathers were both significantly and independently associated with offspring depression and conduct disorder. The authors investigated whether the association between adolescent problem behavior and adult substance use and mental health disorders was general, such that adolescent problem behaviors elevates the risk for a variety of adult disorders or outcome specific, such that each problem behavior is associated specifically with an increased risk for disorders clinically linked to that behavior. The results, each problem behavior was significantly related with each clinical diagnosis. The association was especially marked for those who had engaged in multiple problem behaviors before age 15. Among those with four or more problem behaviors before age 15, the lifetime rates of substance use disorders, antisocial personality disorder, and major depressive disorder exceeded 90%, 90%, and 30% in males, and 60%, 35%, and 55% in females, respectively. It's not likely to be controversial that genetics and upbringing both contribute and both have effects on the personality of people growing up. This, I mean, this seems self-evident. What would be controversial and seemingly unfalsifiable would be the claim that the soul is responsible, that the soul is responsible for personality traits. And if you claim this from a Christian perspective, you'd be forced to admit that God programmed you prior to birth with traits like intelligence, trustworthiness, empathy, and courage, or that he withheld these traits from you. In either case, unless you also take the position that you were pre-existent to your conception, as well as being a thinking and mature soul with the ability to make logical choices in a fair environment, you'd be undercutting the very idea of your own free will. So I ask you again, if you were born as Jeffrey Dahmer, would you have resisted becoming a serial killer? And if so, how? With what tools would you use? Your soul? Would your soul guide your body to a different outcome? Just because some people may tend to believe what their culture believes, does that determine right and wrong? The most damaging crimes in civilization past have had a universality to their prohibition. Such things as murder, theft, and rape. As, as far back as we find written records, we see that societies prohibited these things. The problem is in much of the past, these prohibitions didn't apply to certain people groups. They applied to the in-group, the elders, the religious and political leaders, or the leaders of the tribe. They certainly didn't apply to women and children and the others. The problem in much of the past is that these prohibitions protected the ruling class or the predominant people group, not outsiders not slaves, not captured peoples, and generally not women and children. So yes, Frank Turek, much of what is right or wrong in human history, even among the Abrahamic religions, has been determined by a social construct, not any objective standards, even if they existed, even if objective standards exist out there somewhere in the world of God, men have not ever followed them. This is axiomatic. If it were not true, Christian nations never would have been holding slaves or colonized. They wouldn't have become imperialistic powers. Many of the wars that Christian nations fought in would not have been fought in if there was an objective standard that anybody could follow. But there's not. There is no objective standard. I tend to agree with compatibilists like Daniel Dennett. So for the sake of argument, let's agree we can make choices, at least partially, out of our own free will. We're like a skier 
Skiing down a slope instead of a boulder jarred loose by an earthquake crashing down the slopes randomly based on the configuration of all the atoms in space between it and the bottom and the irresistible force of gravity. But we must acknowledge that skiers who were skiing down a slope didn't get there on the slope able to afford a ski trip completely out of their own free will choices going back to conception. A skier didn't choose their body type or their athleticism or the family culture that they were born into that their parents would be able to even afford to take them skiing, especially in competitive skiing, which is very expensive and parents play a huge role. So champion skiers and ice skaters and golfers and basketball players and football players and even concert pianists and other, other forms of competitive nature where children must start at an early age to have much chance at competing it very much depends on their parents there's never been an olympic champion ice skater or any champion olympic that wasn't helped with their parents or some adults in training no no um five-year-old ice skater was driving themselves to the ice skating rink when they were five and six and seven and eight. This here is my daughter Tanya. It's easier for me to put her on ice if you know what I mean and we figure with the right training she can make the most of her gift like ice capades maybe one day or something. Wayne Gretzky, perhaps the greatest hockey player in the history of the NHL and one of the greatest athletes ever to walk the earth, did not build himself an ice rink in his backyard when he was a child. So I ask again, I ask this question again, if a child is praying at their bedside, dear God, help me have a good night's sleep, help daddy at his work, help mommy feel better, watch over our family, is God listening? I didn't mean can God hear the child, certainly an Omni God can hear everything that happens from trees falling in the wilderness to the flapping wings of a butterfly. What I mean is, is God listening? Is God listening to the prayers of this child regardless of the faith traditions of her parents? What if her parents are atheists? What if she will become later in life, which would be known to God presumably, some type of Christian that in your mind isn't a real and true Christian? Is God listening to that girl's prayers? Does he know ahead of time that she'll be in the wrong religion or the wrong faction of Christianity and ignore her prayers? Or does he listen to up to some age of accountability and then stop listening? Please bless that the girls won't try to kiss me at recess anymore. What if a child is praying to Allah or Krishna? If you're a Christian, do you believe God ignores these prayers? That he holds the child accountable to not knowing the proper name of God? Does, does God punish one for future crimes? If, if you believe he listens and cares and loves, why would he stop at an arbitrary age? If he listens and cares for the five-year-old, why not the six-year-old? Why not the seven-year-old? Perhaps God saves everyone who is a true believer to whatever they believe, even if their beliefs are absurd. If that's not the case, then you have to believe that God looks into the future of the five-year-old and realizes she's taking the wrong path at, say, 17, and he ignores her prayers. Your professor is talking about how people tend to follow their culture. Okay, so what? So what? So what, Frank Turek? Is, is Frank Turek a sociopath? Does he have no empathy? He says, so what? Children follow their culture because they're taught its values are correct. And, that, and those are the best values that a human can have. When was the last time you heard a politician say to a child, you should leave this country as soon as you can because it's a terrible place and I'm the worst leader. This is a terrible country. Do you think children are told their country 
is a terrible place? Or perhaps, no, perhaps children are told their country is the greatest country on, their, on the whole planet. You know, we hear a lot, especially during campaign season, about how great America is or how great America was. We grew up, I grew up hearing that America was number one, and I never questioned that. I was, we are number one, damn it, and we'll kill anyone who says we aren't. What do you think the best country in the world is? Um, Chicago. The 21st century is going to be the American century. Because this right now is the greatest country on earth. Let me, let me tell you something. The United States of America is the most powerful nation on earth. We are America, second to none. Our troops are the finest fighting force in the history of the world. And we own the finish line. Don't forget it. Don't let anyone ever tell you that this country isn't great. And in the midst of his story, one of my friends turned to the other and said, we don't know how lucky we are. And the Cuban stopped and said, how lucky you are. I had some place to escape to. And in that sentence, he told us the entire story. If we lose freedom here, there's no place to escape to. This is the last stand on Earth. America is the greatest country in the United States. Because mm -hmm. I think one of the things that causes a lot of problems in this country, and this comes from the Democrats, it comes from the Republicans, is that America is the greatest country in, in the history of the planet. That's what both parties say and the mainstream media says. What do you think the greatest country in the world is? America. When was the last time you heard a Sunday school teacher telling kindergartners, get out of this church, kids, it's terrible. This church is awful. Get out before it's too late, get out. Children are taught that their religion is the right religion. The, f the religion of their family, generally extended to the culture and the geographic area that they live in, that they were born and raised in. They're usually told that's the correct and right religion. The Lord is here tonight. And his name is Jesus. There's only one God. And then he's going to praise out his tears and just worship God. Well, that love him honor him, cherish, and keep him in sickness and health. At this time, I would like to present to you the world's youngest ordained minister and the world's youngest evangelist, Marjo Gortner. I remember my mother going through very, uh, well, correctional activities. As a child, I'd want to go out and play, and we'd have to spend hours and hours you know, memorizing, and my mind would slip. Finally, my mother would begin to lose her patience with me, and she would put a pillow over my head, maybe, and smother me for a little bit. Other times, she'd hold me under the water faucet, but she never wanted to put any marks on my body because she knew I had to be in front of the press, and so she'd never hit me or anything. And even if they're a minority somewhere, if if a child grows up in a in a religious minority, it's pounded even harder into their minds that they're that they're right and, and being persecuted or punished or being on the outside is proof that they're in the right position and that God loves the faith of those who fight against the majority. Children are taught from a very early age that the belief system they're being taught has good evidence behind it and is the right and true religion. That doesn't determine right or wrong or true or false. It just shows that people uncritically sometimes just follow whatever their culture follows. Frank, are you expecting children to think critically, to critically evaluate the things their parents tell them? Are you expecting them to use logic and critical thinking and research and evaluate their parents and their teachers teaching so that they'll know that they're right or wrong? And at what age, Frank, do you expect this? At, uh, do you expect a five-year-old to do this, a six-year-old, seven, eight, nine, ten? What, at what age, Frank, do you expect them to critically evaluate the things that have been put in their head and told to them over and over and over for years through their entire childhood? What's true is not what other people believe. What's true is whatever the evidence 
lead you to. Why is it that Christian children grow up and claim that the evidence, that the evidence leads them to the conclusion that Christianity is true, while Muslim kids grow up and they claim that the evidence leads them to the conclusion that Islam is true, and why do Hindu children etc etc why do they grow up and claim that the evidence leads them to the conclusion that their religious position and their religious belief and their religious values are the right ones doesn't it seem clear doesn't it seem obvious that how one evaluates the evidence is largely predetermined by how one was raised and what one was raised to believe do you understand that the evidence that proves the religion of your childhood is always the strongest evidence in everyone's mind with a f the few small exceptions of people that change face or become unbelievers. It might be true that if I was in Saudi Arabia, I'd be a Muslim, but that doesn't necessarily mean Islam's true. If Frank Turek had been all other things equal, born to Muslim parents in a Muslim country or a Muslim community, he'd be telling us right now that Islam is true. Just follow the evidence, he would shout. He would be confident. Islam is a religion that stands up to scrutiny. Frank Turk would say Islam is the religion that if you look at the evidence is obviously the right religion. You merely need to read the Quran. You merely need to pray to Allah and all will be revealed to you. Muslims are as convinced that their evidence proves Islam that Frank is convinced Christianity's evidence proves Christianity. It seems to outsiders that if the evidence was as strong and compelling for any of these claims as their respective apologists claim loudly from every rooftop, that the religious would convert, like all the, all the religious people that believed in God would convert to the one that was obviously true. If a loving, caring, compassionate God existed among the revealed religions, wouldn't he ensure that people had the necessary, the necessary clarity to know which religion is true? If you believe in some segment of all the God believers that that God has provided you evidence and you clarity that that you have the truth what 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 does that say about God's care and concern and love for all the other people that have it wrong why why doesn't God provide them the evidence that you have and you say I know you say he has but they don't read it the same as you do they and guess what? You read the evidence for your religion based on how you have already determined, generally from childhood, that it's true. And this is true for every single religion. Watching Let the Quran Speak. Why should someone seriously consider Islam? It's either with a message from God or from the Prophet Muhammad himself as a writer. But it couldn't be from the Prophet Muhammad himself as a writer for several reasons. If, if he was writing this book on his own, trying to convince people that this is from God, then uh, why, why would he do that? He would be insincere and, and he should uh, not suffer the kinds of persecutions and so on that he did uh, for the sake of this message. He should give it up easily if people did not want to believe in it. Hinduism has practices that have scientific reasons behind them. And number 10, we have Namaste. We've all heard this before, Namaste. Well, in Hindu culture, people greet each other while joining both their pumps. And this is termed Namaste. And the general reason for this tradition is that by joining hands, Hindus are showing respect to the other person. But if we look at it scientifically, we can see that joining both hands means joining the tips of the fingers. And the tips of the fingers are pressure points of the eyes, ears, and the mind. Joining and pressing those against each other help you remember the person for a longer period of time. And also, no exchange of germs happens here because you're not touching the other person. So yeah, a whole lot more than just uh, a greeting in this motion here. And just because a lot of people don't care about the evidence or look at the evidence doesn't mean it isn't there. It's there. You can evaluate it. 
Christians mostly fall into two distinct camps. The first group are Christians that grew up that way. They grew up Christian. They often receive baptism if they're evangelical, when they're somewhere between 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. When they're old enough to ask for it, depending on their community's belief, they'll be baptized. And Catholics often are baptized as infants, but later in their life they'll have a feeling or an epiphany. Mormons will call it a burning in the bosom that they they know that they know that they're that they're being told by God they're in the right faith. And this is true. You people use different words for this, but whether it's a Catholic or a Mormon or a evangelical Pentecostal, what the the meaning is always the same. They know, they know that they have the right. I know that I know they'll say. Now the second group of Christians are people who experience something profound as adults, either a crisis, so it might be like an impending divorce or an actual divorce or cancer or a terrible tragedy, a car wreck or losing a child. In the midst of a crisis, it is often easy to reach out for something to fill this void in your mind and heart it has brought fear of the unknown. Among the second group of people who become Christians, there is adults who leave a bad religious or what they've determined is a bad religious system for a less bad religious system or a better religious system. You often hear these in testimonies of people that have left what they term a cult and they're now in a mainstream religious church. And just because a lot of people don't care about the evidence or look at the evidence, Frank is dismissing the experience of nearly all religious people. People rarely evaluate evidence to become religious. They don't research for years and compare religions and read religious texts and compare doctrines and claims and then decide which religion to pick and which church or which sect or which form of that religion. And seriously, since most people become part of their faith group and the, the membership of their church as children, what is Frank implying when he says, doesn't mean it isn't there, it's there, you can evaluate it. That children should be evaluating the evidence, the, they should be self-aware enough to evaluate the evidence and question their parents? Is that is that what Frank's implying? At what age should they do this? Five or six or seven? Doesn't the Bible teach Jews and Christians to honor your mother and father? So is Frank actually expecting the children in Christian and Jewish homes? So let's say they're in a in a Christianity form that Frank thinks is, is, is a false Christianity, but they still use the Bible. Does Frank expect a seven or eight or a nine or a 10 year old child to dishonor their parents and evaluate their religion? Aren't Muslim children taught to respect, obey, and care for their parents throughout their whole lives? That's a fundamental part of Islam. How about Hindu children? Aren't they taught that respecting and serving one's parents is a sacred duty? Do you see the common theme here? If children are taught by their religion that respecting, honoring, obeying, and caring for one's parents is a righteous obligation, a duty, something only second to loving and honoring God and His commandments isn't the very idea of researching another faith, looking for evidence that your faith is wrong, and considering another faith as more true and right in and of itself a disgraceful act of disobedience and treachery? Do you understand what Frank Turek is asking children to be able to do? It's ludicrous. And of course we know any child that became an apologist for their parents' faith, think Sean McDowell following Josh McDowell's footsteps, that child's a superstar. They're envied by other parents. Anyone that's been part of a church community knows how much pride a parent takes when their child can repeat scripture and is honored by other parents for being good and obedient and following the commandments of their religion. These parents would declare, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Contrast that what happens 
to the parents of sons who become apostates. The parents of those children, they're ashamed. They're disgraced in their community. The other parents think, what did you do wrong? Prayers would be offered up, of course. Others in the community would be warned against allowing such evil acts to happen in their family. In some countries, becoming apostate carries the death penalty. Is Frank really confused about why Christians who seek evidence tend to find, just like Muslims who seek evidence, tend to find that their faith is the true faith? Does Frank Turk not realize Hindu and Muslim apologists are as skilled as he is at proving the truth of their religions? That people in Ohio tend to be Christians while people in Jakarta tend to be Muslims and people in Salt Lake City tend to be Mormons, this doesn't prove the truth claims these adherents make about their faith, obviously, we all agree on this. Atheists and religious people always agree that those other guys are spouting nonsense. Those other guys are wrong. Where Christian apologists like Frank go astray in this is that they don't address the real issue raised by skeptics. Skeptics are not saying that stuff can't be true because a lot of people in other cultures don't think that it's true or that a bunch of false beliefs means that all beliefs on the topic are also false by the process of elimination. No, this is what we observe. We observe that Muslims tend to find Islamic evidence overwhelming that Islam is true. It's proof that Islam is true and correct and that that's the one right way to worship God. That all reasonable people should be Muslims. One person in charge. There's one captain of a ship and one king of a country. 1,400 years have passed and the Quran remains in its original language completely unchanged. Muslims claim the Quran is the direct word of God. Any changes, even if it was a single letter, would instantly falsify this claim. Allah challenges the reader to look for contradictions if they think the Qur'an is man-made. What we find is that the message is 100% consistent with absolutely no contradictions. Amazingly, Allah told us that when people listen to the Qur'an being recited, they are impacted and you see them start to cry. <laughs> for these reasons, Muslims can proudly claim that the Qur'an is self-evident to be entirely from God. If you are still skeptical, pick up a Qur'an and read it for yourself. We're observing, uh, as skeptics, we're observing that Hindus tend to find Hindi evidence proving beyond any doubt that Hinduism is true and that Krishna is God. One of the concepts within Christianity is the idea of sin, right? Mm -hmm. And that we are born <laughs> you know as babies we're born evil like there's something innately wrong with us as human beings that we've already been born into sin so it's like the 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 starting point is already so different from hinduism because it's telling us from the get-go that something is wrong with our nature and it creates so much incompletion and suffering in us and i i've experienced personally that how much that affects your beliefs about yourself and life as you go through life, you know? There's so much guilt associated with that, so much unnecessary self-hatred, you know, and fear that does lurk in your inner space when you're constantly hearing these concepts affirmed and spoken about and that, you know, if you don't repent and, and you know, the concept, concept of hell and the devil and um, all of these things are very much based in we should choose the right thing the, out of fear of punishment versus understanding the the dharma in every, and why we would want to do the right thing or our duty because we understand the context that you know what what we put out comes back to us and right all of these type of you know cosmic spiritual principles we notice that religious jews tend to find their religion to be true Buddhists and Sikhs and Baha'is and Jans all believe they're following the religious system that is the most true. Guess what? Everybody thinks their religion is the right one. Frank's continual point that just because he would 
probably or likely or could have been a Muslim had he been born in Jakarta or Saudi Arabia doesn't affect the truth is missing the point. The point here, Frank Turek, is that if you had been born in a Muslim country and been born to Muslim parents who loved you and cared for you in such a way that your life drove you to become an apologist for Islam, you would find the evidence for Islam as convincing as you now find the evidence for Christianity. When apologists argue that the fact people tend to be the religion where they were born and raised and grew up is not a proof against Christianity because Christianity has such great evidence. They're missing the point. The point is you find Christianity's evidence convincing only because you were born, raised, and told through your whole childhood that Christianity was true. You, so you can't see, you have blinders on, you can't see anything else except how wonderful the evidence is. If you had been born a Muslim, you would be saying the same thing about the evidence for Islam. The evidence for Islam is almost self-evident. Just ask an, a Muslim apologist. They can't understand how you can possibly be so blind as a Christian. Ask a Jew why they are so blind as to not see that Jesus is the Messiah. And they will tell you it's obvious that he's not. The problem is that you can't clearly, and this is self-evident and axiomatic, you cannot clearly evaluate religious evidence for your own religion in which you were indoctrinated into as a child. It's not possible. If you are fair, you will use the outsider's test for faith and you will evaluate your religion the same way you evaluate other religions using the same standards not allowing yourself to have double standards and special pleading and if you do that honestly you'll realize that being a Christian really makes no logical sense it's just an emotional thing if it makes you feel good and you like the emotions and you like your Christian friends that's fine but it doesn't make it true this has been Michael Beverly. Thank you again for if you stuck with me through this. And please like and subscribe and do all the good stuff to help support this channel and the mission that we have. Helping people to ask good questions and to think better. Not to tell people, like apologists do, what they should believe. Thank you. Mm -hmm.